Welcome back to Vance Reading. We're in Rule 9 uh, for Beyond Order by Jordan Peterson. Uh, rule 9. If old memories still upset you, write them down carefully and completely. But is yesterday finished with you? Imagine you undertook some truly terrible actions in the past. You betrayed or hurt people in a genuinely damaging manner. You damaged their reputation with gossip and innuendo. You took credit for their work. You robbed them materially or spiritually. You cheated on them. Or imagine instead uh, you, that you've been the target of some such events. And let us also assume you have become wise enough to try to avoid repeating the experience. In both circumstances, as perpetrator or victim, the actual events and the associated memories evoke fear, guilt, and shame. Why? In the first case, you have betrayed yourself. You did not play the medium to long-term gain properly and are suffering the consequences. You are not the sort of person other people choose to have around. You might not even be the sort of person you want to have around. In the second case, you were badly mistreated by someone else. In some real sense, however, it does not matter where you were suffering because of self-betrayal or at the hands of others. What does, ma what does matter is that you do not desire any recurrence. Now, if you recall the memory or it comes back unbidden, complete with terror, shame and guilt, this means something specific. It means that you fell into a hole, a pit, a more accurately or were pushed, or more accurately you were pushed there. And that is not good. But what is worse is that you do not know why. Perhaps you trusted other people too easily. Perhaps you were too naive. Perhaps you were willfully blind. Perhaps you encountered genuine malevolence on the part of another or, or yourself. And that is the worst situation and the one most difficult to overcome. But as one level of analysis, whether you fell or were pushed makes little difference. Not to the emotional systems that have emerged over the course of evolution and now serve to protect you. They care about one thing and one thing only, that you do not repeat a mistake. This alarms those, I'm sorry, the alarms those systems activate. Let me repeat that whole, I didn't say that correctly, apologies. But, a one le sorry, but at one level of analysis, whether you fell or were pushed make, makes little difference. Not to the emotional systems that have emerged over the course of ev evolution and now serve to protect you. They care about one thing and one thing only, that you do not repeat a mistake. The alarms those systems activate are fear-based, that is too weak a phrase, terror-based is more accurate, the kind of terror limited to neither time nor place, and all they care about is reminding you of the still extant danger. A part of reality and a perilous part has remained unmapped, low resolution, lacking sufficient detail, and so has a part of you. You are not sharp, alert, dangerous, wary, wise, or kind enough, who knows? So. That so that terror systems protecting you are confident in your ability to wind your way successfully through the same maze if once again manifests itself in front of you. Learn from the past or repeat its horrors in imagination endlessly. Frequently, people do not so much repress the terrible things that happened in the past as, as refuse to think them through, pushing them out of their mind or occupying themselves with other activities. They have their reasons and sometimes trauma, tra traumatized people uh, appear literally unable to understand what befell them. It can be prohibitively difficult for abused children, for example, to generate a worldview philosophically sophisticated enough to span the full spectrum of human motivation. They simply cannot understand why someone might torment them physically or abuse them sexually. If they are young enough, it is likely that they do not even explicitly comprehend what is happening. Comprehending such matters is exceptionally challenging even for adults, but in some unfortunate and arguably unjust sense, it does not matter. Refusal or inability both leave a geographic area in memory unexplored, active and rife with danger. It is a psychological truism that anything sufficiently threatening, threatening or harmful once encountered can never be forgotten if it has never been understood. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, to orient ourselves in the world and we need to know where we are and where we are going, where we are, the concept must optimally include a full account of our experience of the world to date. If you do not know what roads you have traversed, it is difficult to calculate where you are. Where we are going, that is the projection of our ultimate ideal, by no means simply a question question say of accomplishment love wealth or power but development of the character that makes all fortunate outcomes more likely and or all unfortunate outcomes less likely we map the world so that we can make the move from where we are from point a to where we are going to point b 
We use our map to guide our movement and we encounter success and obstacles along the way. The successes are both confidence building and exhilarating. Not only are we moving toward our ultimate desire, we appear to be doing so properly and are therefore not only moving ahead but validating our map. The obstacles and failures are by contrast anxiety provoking, depressing and painful. They indicate our profound ignorance. They indicate that we do not understand with sufficient depth where we have been, where we are, or where we are going. They indicate something we have built with great difficulty and wish above all to protect this floor to degree, both serious and not fully understood. We must recollect our experiences and derive from them their moral. Otherwise, we remain in the past plagued by reminiscence, uh, reminiscences tormented by conscience, cynical for the loss of what might have been unforgiving of, your, of ourselves, and, un, and unable to accept the challenges and tragedies facing us. We must recollect ourselves or suffer in direct proportion to our ignorance and avoidance. We must gather everything from the past that we avoided. We must rekindle every lost opportunity. We must repent for missing the mark, meditate on our errors, acquire now what we should have acquired then, and put ourselves back together. And I'm not saying this is always possible. I've seen people so lost that there was not enough spark left to survive. The person in the prison had been rendered to insig in insignificant to confront in his or her current condition, what was avoided even by a once healthier self in the past. And cynicism about the future rationalizes the avoidance and deception. That is how, and there is no limit to its depth. The humility required to clam clamor out of such hell exists in precise proportion to the magnitude of the unrequited errors of the past. And that is enough to send a shudder of true terror down the spine of anyone, even partly awakened. We are not allowed, it seems, to avoid the responsibility of actualizing potential. And if we have had, if, and if we have made a mistake in the past and left, what could be unmanifest regardless of the reason then we pay the price for that and the ability to forget and in the emotion that constitutes the pangs of conscience for past misbehavior imagine that when you are very young the map of the world you used to guide your immature self is correspondingly underdeveloped like a child's drawing of a house always straight and centered portraying only the front always or close enough with a door and two windows always with a square for the outside wall and a triangle for the roof, always with the chimney and smoke, which is a surprise because smoking chimneys on are not all the common, all that common now. The sun is shining irrepressibly. A circle with a rays emanating from it. There are a few flowers, single lines with the schematic of a bloom at the top and two leaves halfway up the stems. It is a very low resolution of representation of a house. It is more hieroglyph than drawing, more concept than sketch. It is something that represents the idea of a house or perhaps home generally like the words house or home themselves. However, it is almost always enough. The child who drew the picture knows it is a house and the other children and the adults who see the picture know it is a house. The drawing does the trick. It fulfills its purpose. It is a good enough map. But all too often appalling events occur within the houses. These are not so easy to represent. Maybe the house has adults in it, parents, grandparents, uncles or aunts, who say such things as never, and I mean never speak to anyone about what happens here. A few squares, a triangle of smattering of flowers and a benevolent solar orb offer only, in, only an inadequate representation of horrors characterizing such a dwelling place. Maybe what is happening inside the house is beyond both toler tolerability and understanding. Both tolerability, toler, tol tolerable, tolerability, and uh, and understanding. But how can what is, but how can what is terrifying be beyond understanding? How can trauma even exist without comprehension? Is not understanding, in some sense, a prerequisite to experience itself? These are all these are all great mysteries, but everyone is not experienced at the same level of conception. We have all been petrified by the unknown, even though that seems a contradiction in terms, but the body knows what the mind does not yet grasp and it remembers and it demands that understanding be established and there is simply no escaping that demand. If something befalls us or perhaps worse, we re-engage in some act that freezes us in terror and nauseates 
us to recall, we are bound by implicable fate to transform raw horror into understanding or suffer the consequences. Um, I to clear. Do not fall twice into the same pit. I had a client who began speaking to me almost immediately after we met over the sexual abuse she suffered in childhood at the hands of an older cousin with whom she lived. She became markedly tearful and upset when she recounted her experiences. I asked her how old she was when, she, when the abuse occurred. She told me she was four. She described her attacker as much larger, stronger, and older than her. I allowed my imagination to roam freely as she spoke, making the assumptions I believed or my fantasy presumed were justified by the nature of her description. I envisioned the nefarious, sadistic, and criminal mach machina machinations. I think machination, machinations, machine. I can't say this word. And criminal machinations of a little of a late adolescent or young adult. Then I asked her how much difference in age there was between her and her victimizer. She replied, two years. He was two years older than me. What? This came as a genuine surprise. It changed the picture in my mind almost completely. I told her what I had been imagining because I wanted her to know what assumptions I had been formulating as she related her story. Then I said, you know, you are all grown up now and have been for a long time, but you told me you, your story in the same way that you might have told it when you were four, when the molestation was still occurring or at least with many of the same emotions. And there is no doubt that you remember your cousin, oh my God, as <laughs> much larger and stronger and older than you. A six-year-old, after all, half again as old as a four-year-old. And from that youngest child's perspective, perhaps more akin to an adult, but your cousin was six, almost as much as a child as you. So here's another way you might consider thinking about what happened. First recall the six-year-olds with whom you are now familiar. You know that they are all still immature and cannot be held accountable as adults might be for their actions, even though they might also not be altogether innocent. I'm not trying to minimize the seriousness of what happened to you, and I'm not questioning the intensity of your emotions, but I am asking you to consider, consider the situation as if you became aware of its occurrence among two children you presently know. Kids are curious, they play doctor, and if the adults around them are not paying attention properly, such games can get out of hand. Would it be possible to consider that you were not molested by an overpowering and malevolent force the way you might be if you were raped now? Maybe instead you you and your cousin were very poorly supervised children. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong, but Jesus Christ, that is a... Whoo, that is, I, I mean, yeah, that's deep, man. That is hardcore. That is one hardcore. And I'm sorry if I'm laughing and it is wrong, but I mean, the statement itself is weird. So um, I apologize in advance, but like that is, it's a big paragraph. Like it's a deep, weird thing. That is just, that is hardcore. Apologies to whoever this person is, but Jesus, um, that is intense. I'm gonna think about a psychologist. I'm not me, but I think from his perspective, he's absolutely correct. And um, he's trying to make her move on and that's an interesting thing. And the way he did it was maybe very, well, it's, I think he's pushing it to go towards her to be better, but because she's treating it, you know, I think, you know, that is a deep thing because people as kids, we have worse imaginations, like, or maybe more intense imaginations when we're young and then that stays with us. And maybe, you know, he's absolutely right that they were poorly supervised as children. And I think that is, it can happen and that's a bad thing. And people need to take care of their kids, you know, correctly. And I, I agree with Jordan. There's like, yo, they're kids. They, they're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, they, they can't help themselves or they don't understand themselves or they don't understand the moral um, situation here. And I think that's his point is like, you can't punish for someone who, who, who's, who's been, who doesn't understand who's, who's been led incorrectly and yeah it's deep man <clears throat> that is whew, that is dark in some important way the memory she retained of her childhood experiences had not altered as she matured she was still experiencing the terror of a four-year-old helpless in the hands of someone old enough to be perceived as a grown-up but her 27 year old self need to, needed to update that memory she was no longer at risk for such treatment in any obvious manner 
and it came as a great relief to her to reframe what had happened. She could now consider it, consider it as a potential consequences of curiosity, untrammeled by adult attention. This shifted her view of her cousin, the situation, and herself. She could now see the event from the perspective of an adult. This freed her from much of the terror and shame still associated with the memories, and it did, and it did so with remarkable rap rapidity. She confronted the horrors of the past voluntarily, finding a causal explanation that was much less traumatic, lacking as it did the vision of her cousin as a malevolent, powerful perpetrator and her as the inevitably hap hapless victim of such force. All this transformation occurred in a single session. Such can be the power of a story surrounding the terrible events of our past. The experience left me with a profound philosophical quandary. The memories my client brought into my office had remained unchanged for decades. The memories we, she walked out with were markedly altered, which then were real. It could easily be argued that her original story was more accurate. It was, after all, as direct an imprint as might be left on the open book of a four-year-old's mind. It had not been altered and therefore changed by any previous therapeutic intervention, was it not, than the genuine article. But it is also the case that an event that means one thing one day might come to mean something quite different, and uh, quite different another. It is so unusual for us to better understand what motivated the otherwise inexplicable behavior of our parents, for example, as we ourselves enter parenthood. And which memory is more accurate? The partial picture of adult motivation we have as children, or the revised recollections made possible by maturity. If it is the latter and does not mean and does not seem unreasonable, and certainly seem true in the case of my client, how is it that an altered memory can become more accurate than one retaining its original configuration. That is a wow. That's actually a good statement there. So I think, he, you know, it's very, uh, firstly, with the first word I learned, there was quandary, philosophical quandary. I love that word. Um, what he's trying to say is all about perspective at the end of the day. And at that time, where her emotional state, where, where she learned what the world was, is full of monsters and, and heroes and whatever, or whatever it is. Um, or a bad force or, you know, at that time, that was what it was because she couldn't understand the bigger picture of life because she was so young. And so what he's trying to say is if you learn something new that you didn't know, then the perspective will change or the memory will be altered. And I think that's very interesting is that for the understanding of a, of a situation better of a, or or, or information that it has not been um, been uh, received yet in the future or has not been disclosed with you may, you know, kind of shelter us from having better perceptions on ourselves. And I think that's an interesting thing. And our memories. And certain things means it's difficult. Also, that's an interesting thing. Is like <sighs> there is some kind of moral ambiguity when it comes to past memories. Is because people teach you, oh, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. But then you have a realization of, okay, what is morality in a, in a long sense? Is because things change. Because firstly, it depends on the situation and what may happen in the future may help you understand why it happened like for instance this is a terrifying thing right but this is the truth is that we have serial killers and psychopaths and firstly we don't know so they start killing people from that perspective they're a monster they're like just doing it randomly they're just evil right but then once you start to get into the, the nicks and crannies of things you start to understand this person was mentally abused or was misled or was being tortured, hurt by other, you know, unfortunate people who are kind of screwed up in their minds. And so th I think that's what, and then we have, you know, killers who, who you, you know, who kill people and they're, the reason for their monstrosity is because of how they were influenced and what perspective they have on life and what makes them feel a certain way. And how they've been taught to feel a certain way and how, what their memories tell them to do. And that's an interesting thing. And so that's the scary thing is that 
that's how actually everyone works is that people work based on you know traumatic experiences or emotional intensive memories that kind of guide you to do certain things or avoid certain things and that's the whole interesting part of the human you know being is that it there's a, there's that system that tells us you know what is you know what stay away from because this hurt last time right that's the but that's if you put it like that that just sounds okay that's what it's doing but the problem is that system has such intensity to certain things that it affects you as a person and you and, and what you need to do but that's what the beauty of what he's trying to say is if you can change the perspective of your memory you can change as a person and i think that's a good point there is that you know i mean the whole thing was like people it's it's a it's a very good philosophy on how to look at life i think especially because life is dangerous life is complicated life is and life can be simple don't get me wrong and it can be great and beautiful but there are parts of life that are complicated and confusing and misinterpreting and you get into a place where there's so much information you don't understand and i think you know the best thing i just learned from this is that you know oh, i hate as cheesy as sound as it's life is about perspective and perspective can change the way you are as a person and every memory you've had and i think to grow and for people not to fall into pits of or how like of uh, depression and how and ex bad experiences they need to somehow re re look at their past and say okay well, what was really going on and people are terrified to ask it and also you know this this is only for you as a person i don't think this will help other people change like around you or maybe it will it doesn't matter but the problem is people are very are persistent in you know their systems are guiding them so they don't want to change if they change that means they lost and they feel like they're not in control and then there's ultimate fear but with this it's actually true that if you read the book it kind of gives you kind of some kind of confidence to understand that changing the perspective of a memory changes your life i think that's a pretty good idea that's i think that's a good thing to tell people that because life is not we weren't given a freaking handbook that tells us, okay, you got to do this, man. You got to do that. We're more given advice from other people to do what and when and how to do and what to do. And then it changes over time because that person was wrong. And I think also what's important is that information changes over time. Uh, the thing that works today might not work the right way like it did before and it worked differently. And we will understand it better, you know, more and more as time goes by. And that's the whole point he's making is that that info you receive may change what happened within the past. And that's a great detail. Anything else to add there? I think, uh, I think, what, you see, the, there is, there's this thing that keeps fighting with me inside my own head is that who decides what is wrong and right what is you know what is wrong or right and that, that that's what's kind of badgering me is that from my past you know and looking deep from you know through other people and what they've said and what i've experienced it's so interesting to like it's so interesting that like i still have this feeling of like i don't know what's wrong or right and i look to like i look to other people on what is wrong or right and don't get me wrong don't like take this out of context but what i'm saying is what i mean is wrong or right to myself as a person like like for instance you have the imposter syndrome and you have certain feelings like that and like why is this person better than me or why is this person not better than me or you know that type of thing and we decide by you know we are influenced by the many or what is in front of us or what is the data like i've written in the previous uh, book uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Don, Daniel Kahneman. And what's interesting is that he points out that the information we have is what is right. Like if we get, we get influenced by the information in front of us, no 
no doubt in the mind, no doubt in his mind that as soon as that information is in front, that is what is right right now, that is correct to you. That seems, you know, correct. But that's not the point. And and, and what I'm saying is that if the case is that perspective can change memory, therefore that means you can have some kind of control over who you are. Right? I think so. And I think that that kind of can 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 blah, 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 can kind of you know can kind of motivate you to be something that you always thought you could be, which means that to become the person you have to be, you might need to have to change the perspective of who you are. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense to change the perspective of each memory and try to grasp on to give you more confidence of who you are and who you can be, right? And what you actually have accomplished. Now, you know, and I think that might be a better way of looking at it because the emotion is within that memory kind of guides us or forces us to think in a certain way. It kind of like, it's like a traumatic uh, experience or like, it's like PTSD, right? Post-traumatic uh, yeah, syndrome in a way. Um, and that's what's interesting is that that PTSD kind of like, oh, kind of makes you kind of hide or kind of makes you um, do erratic things or do stupid things or, you know, and that's what's interesting. That's what, that is, whoo, that is hardcore right there. And so thinking about it, man, you can, if the case that memory, because memory is perspective, like it changes. Things change. You grow old. The more info you get, the bit things your perspective changes. Things. Sorry, I'm going in circles here, but because it's such a revelation to me that what he's trying to say is you can change within this. You can become something or feel in a certain way by just changing the perspective of a memory. And I think that is really cool. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. I think that maybe this is advice that people should actually go through like from the book follow he says he was a psychologist and the same and i think that is really uh eye-opening and that i think you know maybe each memory is like in each version of you and you didn't have the complete perspective or didn't have a better perspective on things at that time and so you can kind of look at yourself at those times and say why did i not know this and why did i not know that and then that kind of like gives you better confidence on to do things that you want to do and I think that's good. But remember, in those memories that you have, you probably have some kind of emotional feeling and some kind of like, like this weird sense that the reason we were like that there was something there that was kind of forcing you. And so you need to somehow kind of like switch. And But there's also the case of proving that concept that of like you need to prove that this is what the point, what I think I'm trying to get to my get into my head is that you need to prove to yourself certain things to change specific perspectives. Otherwise, you're going to keep on reminding yourself, right, that this way of doing things is going to still keep on happening. And that's what your brain is telling you. So you, there needs to become a sign of proof of concept that allows you and then think about that memory, bring it up, see what that, see, and then that you can do some kind of comparison there where you say, okay, this is what happened. This won't always happen. And so what your brain, I think that's what may be the best way, in my opinion, because I've seen it and I've done it before, where <clears throat> you have some kind of traumatic experience and then you don't want to do something again, but then you can do it again later, uh, later um, and see what happens. And then something else happens, A good, something good happens, right? And then the whole point what I'm trying to make, you have to get some kind of uh the evidence base, experience based of trying to beat down the the uh, evidence of of the traumatic experience. I would, I would say so that you can prove that okay, this firstly was uh, this happened because of this, and I can prove it because of that. And so you know, for instance, like tennis players, right? or soccer players or let's go with tennis players you hit a forehand you're gonna miss it right 
but then you keep on doing the forehand and the forehand and the forehand and then what happens you get better 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 and then you hit the best forehand constantly that's the point what i'm trying to make is that experience in a way will guide you to gain a better perspective on that memory and it will also give you more memories that will give you positive feedback and give you a a self revelation that you can you can do the thing that you wanted to do and i think that's the point all right that's it i'm going to end it there that was pretty cool that was, you know uh that was me just rambling unfortunately i'm on the improvisation here so it's a bit you know difficult i'm not planning on to say certain things in a certain way and i'm trying to read the book um the way i would read it in my mind maybe a little slower and a little bit less clack you know a little clusterish it's a bit everywhere because i'm tired but anyway i wanted to read that to you guys and it was super interesting that that part one of the book of that rule because it hits hard it hits hard with everyone and i guarantee i don't know why this stuff hasn't like he hasn't this type this stuff needs to be uh on you like youtube man like why is this not crossing because people you know it, why isn't it crossing the platform because this is actually what is needed because people need to feel better about themselves and i think this is a good good topic to talk to i don't understand why is this not brought up very interesting why youtube doesn't bring this type of content up or maybe it hasn't i mean because no one talks about it but super super informative and i think that it will help many people if someone watches this video <laughs> or even read the book so yeah thanks guys for watching this one really excited to uh, continue reading i'm a bit a little bit dead i've got a lot of things in personal life happening and work life so i hope you enjoy the video sorry for the blabble of words but yeah i think that was a pretty good part that i think that you should watch and listen to listen to have a good day guys and like and subscribe please it would really help i mean it doesn't but whatever do it anyway <laughs>